Well, let's, uh, let's introduce our uh, keynote. And for those who have not heard of Stormy Peters, um, uh, Executive Director of the Gnome Foundation and overall a, a very cool person if you follow her blog, the, there's a great uh, context here that a lot of us sometimes miss about interaction between the people and what open source really has become to a lot of us personally. And that, that's kind of a little bit what she's going to talk on. It's going to build on what we heard about yesterday with, the, uh, with what open source can really do for the community and, and how that affects us and, and what we get out of it. So with that, we'd like to welcome Stormy Peters. Thanks. Thanks. So last night, we heard that you should always give a talk about something that you're passionate about. And while I'm passionate about free and open source software, I'm even more passionate about the people that work on it. Um, to me, it's possible because of all the people. And it's, it's an amazing community. At the GNOME Foundation, I get to work with people that are doing, they're working on GNOME because they're passionate about working on it. And that makes my job so much more fun um, than going to work with people that are just getting paid to do it. So a couple of years ago, I was at a conference, and I was sitting in the audience. And I don't remember what the talk was about. It was at OSCON, though. And I was sitting there, and the woman that was speaking said that if you start working on something because you love it, and then you get paid to work on it, if that paycheck goes away, you'll stop working on it. And I kind of went, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, you know, because at the time I was working at HP and then OpenLogic, and my whole job has been, you know, it was about getting companies and communities aligned and, and helping to bring corporate funding to, to open source. And I, I still do that at the Gnome Foundation. And so I thought, you know, I better look into this. I better figure out, um, you know, are, are we really killing the way it works? Um, so, so show of hands here, how many people um, got into free software as not part of their job? Like, you started working on it, so probably 75, 80% of the room, more. Um, and how many of you now get paid to work on free software? It's about a third to half. It's kind of hard to tell with the color of the seats. Um, so, so maybe this, this question is relevant. So I'm, I'm going to share some of the studies um, that I found um, with you and then some kind of the thoughts that I had about how companies get involved in free and open source software and how that might be affecting projects. Um, and and I, I, I don't have like the URLs of all the studies on here. Um, they're all somewhere in my blog. I've been trying to, tra I spent the last week like trying to type out my talk so I could put it like in an ebook on my blog. And I tried to use Google Voice to do it. I tried to like call Google Voice and talk my talk and see if it would transcribe it. It didn't work. Um, so one of the, the first or most studies that struck me um, was one that was done with preschool kids. Um, and the preschool kids, they took two classrooms and they brought in these special markers, um, just regular markers. But they told the kids they were special markers. And in the first classroom, they had prizes. So after the kids finished the drawing with the special markers, um, they handed out prizes for the pictures. And I think like all US sports and stuff, everybody got a prize. Um, it wasn't for the best. And, and so in the other classroom, they took out the special markers. They called them special markers. The kids colored. And when they were done coloring, you know, they did whatever they normally do with their, their pictures. They put them in the recycle bin or in their cubby to take home or in the trash can. And no big deal was made about it. A Couple days later, they brought out the special markers again. And uh, they put them out in the rooms. And in the first room, the one that had gotten prizes for playing with them the first time, Nobody picked them up to play with them. And in the second room, the kids picked up the markers and colored like the first time they did. And so they asked the kids in the first room, they're like, how come you didn't color with the special markers? And they said, well, there's no prizes. Why would I want to do that? And in the second room, they asked the kids, so why are you playing with the markers? And the kids said, because it's fun. So it seemed pretty relevant to open source software. The next study didn't mean to be a study. I think I first read about this one in Freakonomics. I could have that wrong. Um, it was in Switzerland, and Switzerland uses a lot of um, nuclear um, power, and they end up with nuclear waste. And nobody wants to take the nuclear waste. Um, no towns want to have it. And so they went around to little towns, and they went door to door, and they said, would you take this nuclear waste as your duty as a Swiss citizen? You know, we have cheap, efficient power, and, and somebody needs to take the byproduct. And about half of the people said, OK, all right. You know, I, I don't want it, but you know, it's my job. It's my duty as a Swiss citizen. You can put it in my town. And they thought, OK, that's awesome. We got like half the people to say yes. Um, what if we threw in like a little incentive? Um, so they decided the incentive would be something like six weeks worth of pay, average pay for the area, a month and a half's worth of pay. So they went back door to door. And they said, you know, we have all this nuclear waste. You have good, cheap power. Um, as your duty as a Swiss citizen, would you take this nuclear power, the nuclear waste, 
And in addition, we'll give you like six weeks worth of pay every year because your town has to put up with this. And in that case, only a quarter of the people said yes. So now that they were offered money, it was okay to say no. So it wasn't okay to say, no, I won't be a good Swiss citizen, but it was okay to say, no, I don't want six weeks worth of pay. Um, so they'd kind of given people an out. Another study, um, again with kids kind of a little closer to home, is uh, they, they offered, um, it, this started in 2007, it's still an ongoing experiment in the New York City area. Um, they decided that perhaps they could pay kids to do well in school. Um, so, so kids aren't attending, they weren't doing well on tests, and so they thought, well maybe we, we can pay, we'll offer an incentive. Um, they offer, actually offered the incentive to the parents. Um, and I think total per kid, it's like $500. Um, so it's not a huge amount of money, but I, I guess depending on your income level, it, it makes a significant difference. Um, and, and they offer these parents of these kids $500, and it's kind of it's got a bunch of things. You know, you get so much for attendance, you get so much for good grades, you get so much for doing well on the standardized tests. Um, and they've been running it for two years. They're still claiming that they don't have enough data to say if it's working. Um, but from the data that you can tell on the website, it has made no difference in elementary and middle school, um, and it's made some difference in high school. So it, and at the time when the study came out, it got a lot of pushback from people, um, especially college professors, college psychology professors like Barry Swarthmore wrote an editorial in the New York Times um, saying that the problem isn't, like, you shouldn't be paying kids to go to school. You need to figure out what's wrong with school and why they're not having fun and, and make it a fun, interesting place for them to come to as opposed to, like, paying for them and then you set up a whole different standard of awards. That one has me a little worried because my three-year-old can get through the night without wetting his bed if you give him a piece of candy in the morning. Um, so I'm kind of wondering, like, you know, when can we take away the piece of candy and, you know, will he pee his bed forever? The next study, also with kids, I guess kids are easy to study or, or the studies attract me, or I don't know. Um, this one was an Israeli daycare, but I think it's a problem that daycares all over the world face. Um, they had parents showing up late. So, you know, they're supposed to come pick up their kids by 6 o'clock. Parents come in at 6.05, 6.10, 6.15, and the daycare center said, come on guys, you know, we have a life, we have to go pick up our kids at school, you, know, you need to show up on time. And so they finally decided, well, maybe we can just charge a big fine. Um, we can charge them money, and, and they'll come pick up their kids on time. And so they instituted a fine, and the opposite thing happened. Um, it was like the fine made it okay. If you were paying someone to stay late, then you didn't have to feel guilty about making them stay late. Um, it was like babysitting, and you didn't even have to like find the babysitter. Which... So they said, okay, guys, forget that, forget that. Um, keep wandering, and I watch the camera go back and forth. Um, so so the, they said, forget that, you know, come pick up your kids on time, we'll get rid of the fine, you know, feel guilty again, you know, we want to get home to our families. And, and it didn't work. Um, people did not go back to showing up on time. Once, once they had paid the fine and they no longer felt guilty, the guilt was gone, and, and they now had this precedence for showing up late. I mean, I can tell you at my daycare, it was a dollar a minute, and the daycare owner actually got really fed up, and she made it five dollars a minute. Um, and she says that worked for her, so maybe if you put the price high enough. Um, although my boyfriend was working late one time, scrapped a multi-million dollar antenna at work, was in a very bad mood, was running five minutes late, and he walked in and they said he owed a fine and he just blew up. Um, she called me, she said, I, I was like on a conference somewhere else in the world, and she said, I hope everything's okay, I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> so they didn't charge us like $25 for that one. So, so the question is, you know, so those are the kind of the studies that say, you know, if someone does something because they, they feel an internal reason to do it, whether it's guilt or love, um, you know, love for markers or um, duty as a Swiss citizen or guilt for making the daycare provider stay late. If they do it for those internal reasons and then you give them an external reason like money or a fine, um, it kind of replaces the internal reason. So my question was, you know, if, if these open source software projects have been really successful, um, a lot of the really large projects got started as free software projects. You know, if you look at Linux, it was this college project. Um, you look at, you know, the Apache Foundation projects, GNOME, a lot of the really large projects got started as free software projects. And then people got jobs, you know, they got a dream job. Suddenly your, your spouse is happy because you're getting a paycheck for it. Um, supposedly you won't have to spend quite so many evening and weekend hours on it because you get to spend 40 hours a week at work on it. Um, and, and, and world is good. Um, you, get to, you get paid to do what you enjoy doing. So, so what happens if you don't like your boss and you quit, or the dot-com you took a job with goes bust, um, or you know, you, your company loses a large client and, and you don't get to do that job anymore? 
what happens? Will all these people go away? And, and so how many people does that actually affect? And I, I think the numbers in the room were kind of um, representative of this. So I went and looked, and, and all the studies that I found show that for most large projects, about 40% of the contributors are paid to work on that project. Um, so like 40% of GNOME people, GNOME contributors are paid to work on GNOME by a company like Novell or Red Hat or, or somebody. Um, and I think when we did the show of hands, that was kind of representative here. Um, there has been a little more pushback that perhaps the people that are paid actually end up being bigger contributors um, or more important contributors. I get to work on more key parts. And, and usually that's because once you get paid to work on it, you get 40 hours a week or more um, to, to work on it. You're not trying to squish it in after your day job. I, I haven't looked into that area. But so this affects, at the moment, um, the fact of does pay affect people's contributions uh, affects about 40% of the people. And, and then I had, so show of hands here. So we had like almost everybody worked in free software, right? Like 80, 90%. How many of you think, and then about half of those, how many people get paid to work on free software? Show of hands. Okay, so how many of you think that if that, if your paid job went away, you would somehow continue to work in free software? How many people think they wouldn't? Okay, so everybody pretty much thinks they would continue to work in free software. And, and so I thought this is a really hard survey question to ask because I can ask you now, you're getting a nice paycheck, um, you're working on something you really love, and if I ask if you would continue to work on it, you'd say yes. Maybe it's kind of like changing a tire. Um, you say, of course I would stop and help somebody alongside the road if they had a flat tire. I would stop and help them change the tire. Um, but when you see someone with a flat tire on the side of the road, you see like half a million cars drive by before somebody stops and helps. So I thought, you know, how, how do you really find out if, if people would? So th that's the, I'm going to show you like three, three things I went through the thought process to try to figure that out. Um, and, and the first thing is, how does the company change the, the project? So if, if you're working on a free software project and you get paid, does that company's involvement through you or as a donation to the project, um, so like in GNOME we have people working on the project, we have people that um, are paid to work on it, that changes what they work on. Um, we have people that, we have companies that just give us money to help fund things that we think are important to the project. How does that change the project? Um, and, and then I'm going to talk about, so th three things. Um, I'm going to talk about how companies um, change the project, how they pay, um, how they pay the project, whether it's an, a salary or, or donation, um, how that, um, why developers work on free software in the first place, so how could that pay change their original motivations, and then how free software, free software's development model is fundamentally different than traditional software. So I think those three factors have to be weighed in. And I'm going to start with like what motivates the developers. Um, and, and you guys can feel free to chime in. You're welcome to raise your hand and ask a question, or just jump in and ask a question at any time. Um, but, but why do people work on free software? What motivated people, um, when, especially when open source software first came out, this was the question I got the most often. I would go to companies and talk about how great free and open source software was, and they would go, so why are these people working on it? Like, you're telling me some guy's working on it in his free time at home? What's, what's in it for him? Um, it's, it's really strange to people not involved in the culture to understand why people do it. So most of the studies, there's, there's been two or three studies that have worked on this, and they all started off with the premise that people worked on it for external reasons, for extrinsic reasons. They assumed, because most people got paid to work on software, that the reason that people would work on free software had something to do with their external environment. What they found was that most of the reasons were actually internal. Um, so most of the reasons that people chose to work on free software were not from an outside influence, but from something inside of them that I'll talk about. For example, um, so they're, they're intrinsic. They call them extrinsic and intrinsic if you want to go read the sociology research. Um, one of the things is that people find it really interesting. Um, people work on open source software because it's fun or it's challenging. Um, the joke I like to use here is that, you know, how many of you are trying to solve the maze? Um, you, know, that, that's the, you know, how many people participated in the Lego contest last night? I mean, it's just fun and interesting, and, and that's why people work on it. Um, you know, it's interesting to see if you can call Google Voice with your whole presentation and have it transcribe it. Then, then there's something to free software about learning. So, you know, you do your day job and it's the same old thing you've been doing all the time. Um, and in free software, you get to go out and learn, if not a new programming language, a whole new environment. You can figure out mobile programming. You know, it's easy to get started with Android, is what we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, you can, you can do, you can learn things. And the studies have found that for most people, learning is worth a 20% raise. 
Um, so if you were offered the same job you're doing now um, at a 20% raise, or you offered a new job doing something new and exciting, that's about the trade-off point. So if you're offered a 30% raise, you might stick with the old job. If you're offered a 10% raise, you'd probably pick the new job at the same pay. And then there's being creative. Um, one of the things I really like about coming to conferences is, is seeing the talks and seeing what people are working on. Um, you know, we saw the, the Ignite talks last night, we saw about robots, we saw about music. It's, it's really fun to, to see what creative applications people have done with things. Um, my, my favorite still has to be the talk I saw um, Jonathan Oxer give, where he's actually set up his mailbox that at home when the mailbox is opened and somebody puts mail in it, it sends him an email. Um, and I, I really need that. <laughs> And, th and then there's the traditional reason that, that people have given for working on open source software, and especially when it first came out, everyone thought that you worked on open source software to, to scratch an itch. Um, you, you worked on open source software because you had a need. Um, so so you, know, you worked on it because you had a DVD and you had a desktop and your DVD wouldn't play in your Linux desktop, so you wrote the software. Or your kid can't speak, so you wrote a sp speech synthesizer for your computer so your kid could, could use it to speak with the world. So people thought the main reason that people worked on free and open source software was to scratch an itch. And I, I still think it's a, it's a very large portion of it, um, but, it but it's missing the other ones. And then people work on, on free software to learn new skills. And, and I'm not talking about learning new skills that you can put on your resume so you can get another job. Um, I, I've tried to sell free software a lot that way, and it, it it doesn't seem to appeal to people at that level. I'm talking about learning new skills like you would take an art class or you would take a carpentry class um, to, to learn something new because it's fun, kind of like that 20% raise. It, it adds a little excitement to your life and you learn something new. And then I, and, and they, the, all the studies put these next two in the intrinsic um, area, and I really think they're extrinsic to some level. Um, so they said a lot of people work on free software to show that they're clever. Um, so they work on, you know, you, you write, so you write the little mailbox thing that, you know, when someone gives you mail, it sends you an email, and, and then you get to go on and give a talk on it, or you get to put it on the mailing list and say, you know, look how clever I am, look how funny this is. Um, and, and to me, that's looking for an external reward, looking for applause, um, but they, they valued it as internal, and, all, and psychologists must know more than I do on the topic. Um, one of the things that I think is really key about free software is, is that it's, 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 a, it's clever and it's, it's fame and it's recognition from your peers. Um, so it's from other people that have the same values as you do. Yeah. No, you're, you're right. So there's some, some extent, yeah, you know you're clever or you have fun. You get to finish it and go, wow, I did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good point. And, and then there's fame, so people do it to, to be recognized. It's, it, it's a place where you can become famous, um, not because of the way you look or the way you sing or, or the, you know, how many friends you have, but you become famous for what you can do and, and what you can accomplish and, and the kind of code that you write. Um, and you, you don't even get to see the other people until you come to a conference like this. So, so uh, any, any thoughts on what, which of those really appealed to people, like why you thought you got started? How many, we could do a show of hands, how many people got, whoa, did I confuse my presentation? I went all the way back to the beginning. Sorry. What was that? Nice review, yes, so you're getting a review, you know, would you really do it? How's the company change the product? I'm going to talk about three things. This is how I prepare for my talk. It's not extrinsic, it's internal. <laughs> so how many people work on free software because it's interesting? So at least half the room. How many people do it because they're learning new things? They could make more money doing something else. Just about everybody. How many people do it because you get to be creative and come up with cool solutions? About a third? I'm totally guessing at the number of hands. Um, how many do it to scratch an itch? You had a problem and you're trying to fix it. So maybe a third, maybe half? See someone waving like this in the back? How many people do it to learn new skills, learn a new programming language, learn the mobile environment? Maybe a third to a half? And how many people do it because you feel clever or you know, it's kind of fun to solve the problem at the end? About a third maybe, quarter, third? And how many people do it because they want to be famous within the open source software community? No one's going to admit to that. One guy in the back, two. <laughs> 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 
what's, what's funny is like a lot of people know my name in the free and open source software community, but my friends outside of it don't, don't know they think I work with this strange thing where software is kind of free, which doesn't make a lot of sense, and I explain it to them over and over again. But I had a friend that Googled me the other day, someone that doesn't normally Google, and she goes, you're famous. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of fun. And, and then how many people here work on free software to do the right thing? Because software should be free, or it should be open, or it should be available to be more people. So I, I left this one out when I was first making my list, and a lot of people <coughs> excuse me, came to me and said that one of the reasons they work on it is to do the right thing, and one of the studies, I actually went and searched and I found a study that said that a third of open source software developers, free and open source software developers, work on free software um, because they feel that software should be free. So obviously Richard Stallman is definitely in this camp. Um, you know, the, the whole idea that if... What? Is it the, well, we need a few people on both extremes. Um, <laughs> I, I do think that by having free software, we as a society are going to get further faster. Um, so the fact, you know, I, I used to manage the CDE team at HP, and, and the thing that was so frustrating to me, now I'm on the GNOME side, on the open source side, the thing that was so frustrating to me was there was all these companies that were part of this standards body. Um, I don't remember how many of us there were, five or ten companies, and we all wrote exactly the same thing um, to meet the standard. And so we all had these teams of people. I had 30 people working on it. Um, and so did IBM, and, and so did Compaq, and they all had the same amount of people working to write the exact same software. And, and nobody would have said that CDE was a competitive advantage for HP. Um, so that was really frustrating. It felt like I was back in college and the whole room of 100 people was writing the exact same program. Um, so, so those are the developer motivations. Very internal, very intrinsic, you know, not external reasons, not about money for the most part. How, how many people work on free software because they want to get rich with free software? Should be a few hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone, Everyone wants to get rich. <laughs> but it's probably not the reason you got started. Could be, though. But the, then the other thing to look at is the type of payment. It turns out the way that companies um, invest money into free software projects makes a big difference. Um, and, go, and there's studies on this. Um, there, there's studies on, on how payment affects, not just free software, but how payment affects motivations. Um, so the first thing is, is payment normal for this thing? Um, so, so for example, it's, it's not normal to get paid to go to church. It's not normal to pay kids to play with markers. Um, so when you pay for that kind of thing, you very much change the motivations that the person had. Um, you might even be attracting people that never would have done it. You know, if, if, you know, if they paid me enough money, maybe I would go to church every single Sunday. Um, if you paid kids enough money, maybe they would play with you know, boring black markers instead of colored markers, um, if you explained to them that money was going to buy them something else. Um, but on the other hand, software is it's a pretty normal thing to be paid to work on software. So it's, it's less likely that paying someone to work on a free software project will, will change their motivations because it's, it's a normal, you kind of expect to be paid to work on software. So it's, it's not strange. Also, it turns out that um, it, it changes people's motivations if you pay for performance or completeness. Um, so for example, if, if I pay you to um, write a new feature for, for GIMP, um, that's different than if I just pay your salary to work on GIMP. And the paying for feature actually changes your motivations more than just getting a salary to work on the project. Negative way, the salary is better than the feature or the performance or the job. Um, then there's employment. So a lot of companies employ people to work on. And this actually, from what I can tell, is the most benevolent way to, to, to put funds into free software projects um, of the last couple that I've said. Um, it's you pay someone to work on a project. And companies vary whether they pay someone to work on a project or whether they pay someone to add company-specific features to a project. And then there's in-kind. Um, so this one's been really popular, but I think has not been um, really figured out yet. Um, so you see this, like, you know, Google hands out developer Android phones. Um, so this is handing out hardware or, or, you know, maybe it's even handing out swag so that people will like your project or work on your project. Um, so for example, when I was at HP, um, Grant Gun Grundler, who's now at Google, um, we were working on getting Linux onto PA risk boxes. And there wasn't a huge amount of community people that were really interested in getting Linux working on PA Risk. Um, so what we did is we offered to send free PA Risk boxes to anybody that wanted to help. 
Um, we sent new ones. We scrambled around the lab and found old ones under the desk. I lost all my foot warmers. Um, so, so we sent them around. And, and when he first started sending them, when Grant first started sending them, he found the, the return rate was like 10%. So if he sent out 10 machines, he would get one developer who actually delivered and, and worked on getting the stuff to work on PA risk. Um, so then he started getting a little more picky and interviewing the people and trying to get their commitment before he sent the machine, and he raised the rate to 30%. Um, so that, that's still not huge. Depends on how cheap hardware is for you. Um, but, but there's been people that are doing, doing this, and it's, like I said, mixed return rates. Um, then there's bounties. Bounties also have kind of a mixed history. So the idea behind a bounty is that you pay for a feature that you want, and you, you know, if you tell on the web or on your website or on the project website, um, you say, you know, here's the feature I want, and here's how much money I'm willing to pay. Um, GNOME did it a long time ago. We didn't have a lot of success with it. Um, we, we wrote up all the things that, that didn't work well for us, and we haven't tried to repeat it. Um, Funimball, the, the open source phone, they're not, they don't make phones, but they make software that goes on phones. They're using grants very successfully. Um, you could point at projects like elance.com. I mean, elance.com works very well, and you could argue that their system is really a bounty. They say what they want written, you do it, you get your bounty. Um, the problems with bounties that we found is that you have to be very clear with what you want up front. So sometimes by the time you finish specifying exactly what you want, um, you might as well have written it yourself, depending on how good you are at writing specs. Um, a lot of the bounty systems, when they first started, let as many people as they wanted just do it, and it was kind of like the first one to come in one, um, and that's really frustrating to, to everybody. On the other hand, we found in GNOME, if you pick someone, you know, five people apply, and I say, okay, you can have it, um, and that guy never comes back, um, never, never writes the software, at what point do you call it quits and, and let somebody else work on it? And we actually had a couple features that took much longer to get written um, because we had assigned it to somebody. And then there's grants. Um, I, I think there's a lot more room for people to apply for grants in free software. I actually interviewed, oh, I just spaced his name. He's on my blog, I interviewed him. Um, he has, his whole career is applying for grants to do projects, and he builds in his fees, and he, it's, it's a grant for a specific reason, and he uses free software to do it. Um, so his, his whole income comes from writing software with free software based on grants. Um, and I think there's a lot more room for other people to do this. Uh, for example, Wikimedia just got a huge grant from the Ford Foundation to help fund work on their project. So there's a few. Um, Gnome has just applied for a couple, um, one to do with usability. Um, and, and so there's, there's room, there's money out there to fund good work. Um, and usually the people funding it, the, the guy that I interviewed and, and other people I've talked to, the people funding the grants, giving out the grants like the Ford Foundation, they don't really care if it's free software or not. Um, so you just write what, what you're gonna write and you can explain that it's free software, but you just talk about the good that the project is gonna do and, and that's what they wanna fund. So, so those are a bunch of you know, kind of theoretical studies and some real world ways of paying, um, but, but it would be easiest to answer the question of would you do it again for free if, if it actually happened. I mean, is there any project out there that we can look at where this has been true? And um, the only project that people pointed me at that I found that, that's really truly representative, I think, of the issue um, was Nautilus in the GNOME world is, is like the file manager. And there's a company called Easel that used to work on Nautilus. And they, and they had great plans for making lots of money off of Nautilus. Um, it didn't work. Um, the company's gone. Nautilus is still there in GNOME. It's, it's a much smaller project than it was when Easel employed a bunch of people. And, and so I thought it should be easy to go find these people that worked on at Easel and, and find out where they went. Um, so I, I don't have a list of the people and where they went, but anecdotally, um, I've heard that everybody that was in the free software community is still in the free software community, maybe not working on Nautilus. But Easel also employed a bunch of people that hadn't worked on free software before, and those people have all gone on um, to other things, non-free software projects. Rumors, they all went to Apple. Um, probably these days, they all went to Google. Um, but but they've, they've gone on somewhere else. And, and so that really brought up the theory that I, I think answers the question with free software. And, and I think, you have a slide. Well, that, that's another point. I, I could say it again later, but I think the thing is, if, if someone pays you to work on a project and then that project goes bust, um, continuing to work on that project that somebody believed in so much they're willing to pay for it, and, and now they're saying it's not worth that paycheck, I think it's hard to continue working on that project. So I think most people that want to stay in the free software world, what they would actually do is they would continue to work on free software, but it would be a different project, one that's still valid and valued by others. Um, how many people does that resonate with? Like if 
project you're working on, got paid to work on, um, you no longer got paid to work on it, but would you continue to work on free software? Would it be on that project or a different project? How many people say the same project? How many people say they'd work on a different project? You like the project you're working on? <laughs> yeah, you're probably going to interview for jobs and find an another job, right? Assuming that you have to eat, and, you know. The the other thing that that really stood out is is um, is it, it that some of the research pointed out is is there inequality in who you pay and don't pay? Um, so, for example, someone left a comment in one of my blog posts on this topic, and they said that they had been at a company and they needed to work a lot of overtime. And one night when they were at the, you know, they were working all their overtime, they found out that some of the people there were getting paid overtime and some of them weren't. So obviously at that point they, you know, everyone that wasn't getting paid just quit because <laughs> because you're not going to work when some people are getting paid. And I think that's very relevant to free software because if you look at the GNOME community, 40% of people are getting paid and 60% aren't. Um, so those 60% aren't leaving, and and why not? Um, it, it, it's a it's a question. Yeah, it, it's a question to be asked. Um, I talked to, to Mitchell Baker from Mozilla, and, and they said that, so that Mozilla was pretty much all of kind of free, that has a history, but a lot of people were working on it for free, and then they started the Mozilla Corporation, and she said that the number of volunteers didn't go down, that 30% of all contributions to Firefox are, are still from people that are not paid by the Mozilla Corporation. Um, so, so this doesn't seem to affect the open source software community as much as it could. So, so if, if people, so this is this was my point that you know if, if people stop working on that project because you know no one's paying them to work on it and so the project isn't worth as much, where do they go? And and I really think they go on to other software projects. And and I think part of this is how many people here work on just one free software project? How many people here work on two software projects? Keep your hands up as I go. How many people work on three or more? Yeah. So so you're working on a number of them anyway, and so I think you. You know, you're always kind of turning them over. You know, one drops off, and you add another one to it. So I think people tend to go to other projects um, as opposed to leaving the free software community. Um, but if they go to the other projects, is it, is it really the same? Is it is it really? Uh, you know, when companies come in and, and they invest in free software, do they change the project? Whether or not they demotivate all these developers if they go bust, um, while they're involved in that project, are they changing the project? And, and bear with me here. I'm going to give you a little history of the world in like two minutes. So, so at one point in time, we had hunter-gatherers, um, and supposedly everyone spent all of their time trying to find food, um, whether it was gathering up fruit or going and hunting animals. Now, since then, I've heard that the only hunter-gatherer society left on this planet that's truly hunter-gatherer, they actually have a ton of free time, and they actually spend a lot of their time sitting around talking and playing with their friends and their family. <coughs> so I'm not sure <coughs> about this myth that we've heard that they had to spend 100% of their time looking for food. They might have actually have it better off than we do. But then we introduced agriculture. And what agriculture did is it allowed us to raise a lot of food at once. And so it freed up, well, first of all, it allowed people to live in towns. Um, so they didn't have to live all spread out um, where they could find the food. Now all of a sudden you could have a field that could feed a whole bunch of people. And so you had people gather in cities. And then it freed up maybe 10, 20% of the people to do something else that wasn't looking for food. And, and so when you had this 10, 20%, um, you started to have people, you know, you could start trading. So you could start trading your eggs for your, for your milk, or you, know, you could make trades. So you started having people like accountants. Um, so you started having the right brain thinkers. Um, then once you had enough people trading things, you had arguments. And so then you had to have attorneys. So these lawyers would come in to settle the debates. Um, then you had people that, you know, their, their families got rich, so they could sit at home and think about things, or they could afford to send their kids to school to learn, you know, about a broader array of things. And, you know, we developed a lot of things, you know, electricity and all that good stuff, and eventually we got to have computer programming jobs. I told you it was going to be a quick history. Oops, I changed slides without meaning to. Um, and, and so, but, but just recently, um, and, and if you read literature um, like Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat, um, Dan Pink's the, the Whole New Brain. Um, there, there's a number of them that are coming out, kind of the, the pop culture type books. But, but they're saying that, that now is really the time of the, the creators. So we had left brain thinkers before. So we had you know, people that were accountants or attorneys. And those jobs were really valued. Um, they paid a lot of money. They still pay a lot of money. Um, and then we have people like artists and mu musicians. And while we value them as a culture, we don't pay them a lot of money. 
Now, in the last you know, 10, 20 years, we're really seeing those two converge. And I think you see it a lot in the free software world. Um, so so it, instead of getting paid just to write code, you're actually creating a whole solution. So you don't have someone whose job it is to define the product, and someone whose job it is to talk to the customers, and someone whose job it is to write code. One person gets to be that, that whole thing. And if you see a problem like your, your mail, um, you don't know when you're getting mail, you, you can write a clever solution. You know, someone didn't spec out the requirements of, you know, you need to check, you know, you need to know when you're getting mail, and so you need to know when the mailbox opens, and you need to put a sensor in there, and when it closes, you need to send you an email. No one mapped all that out for him. He, he did it all himself. Um, and, and so we have people in the free software world who, who are, are not just programmers, not just left brain thinkers, but they're also right brain thinkers, and, and they're designing, and they're creating solutions. And, and, and so you have these people that, that were, were designers. Um, you know, in the free software world, they, they got to decide, you know, you get to decide what GNOME looks like. You, know, you might argue with a lot of people about whether the icon should be in the menu or not, um, but, but ultimately it's, it's the coders that, that decide that. Um, and, and then they get their dream job working at a company, getting paid to do that, and, and all of a sudden they, they have to do things the company way. They get to go to meetings, um, even get to go to teleconference meetings that last several hours. Um, how many people have attended a teleconference meeting for an open source software project? Not many. Um, there's, there's a few. But now at a company, all of a sudden, you're attending a lot of meetings. Um, and, and then more importantly to me is, is the process is no longer one where the person writing the code, who's using the code, who's talking to the users, is figuring out what the project looks like. You go back to the company method that we've been using for the past however long software has been around, where there's a person who um, talks to the customers, decides what kind of product they need, um, the product manager specs it out and writes up this whole design spec document that says what it's going to look like, and, and then they hand it over to the engineering team. The engineering team develops it, gets passed off to the QA team, the QA team tests it, um, and then it goes out to customers, and it's the customer support guys who answer the calls on the product. And, and so now instead of having one person who kind of encompasses all those roles, you've put people back into boxes. And I think we lose something in that process. We lose the very thing that has made free software successful. Um, so we've got this, you know, people that are used to doing it the free software way who've made these products that companies are very interested in, um, and it's proven to be very successful, but then when the companies adopt it, they try to fit it into the company method. Um, and, and there's a few companies now that are really, um, that have learned and, and are really trying to work with the free software world. Um, but traditionally, when they take the free software, they try to peg it into the old ways. And then people get really frustrated. Um, so how many of you here have had an argument with your manager or your product manager or your design person about the why the way they want to do it is not the right way to do it? Yeah. And in the end, I've actually heard managers say, well, you're going to do it this way because I said so. Um, and so to me, that, that's kind of killing the, re the way free software worked is those arguments were allowed to happen. Um, they are allowed to happen. Those arguments happen. They happen on the mailing list. They happen in IRC. They get very heated. Sometimes they divide communities. Um, but but it, it, it added something to the process when you had those coders part of that decision process. And at, especially at large companies, um, th that's not the way the process works. And I actually had a, a friend who um, was working at a company, and he had and I've heard a couple stories like this. He, he had a customer who'd managed to contact him and wanted a feature. And so he told his boss that he was going to work on the feature. And, and the boss said, no, 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 we got to put out a release next week. You know, we, we've promised, you know, we, we've taken an order for, you know, $100,000 from this other customer to have this release out next week. You can't fix that feature now. You know, we can't do that. Um, so he came in and worked all weekends to do the feature for the customer on his own time. Um, Monday morning, his boss gets in and he said, look, I, I did the feature for the customer. That customer is happy. You know, now I can work on the release and, and everything will be good. And his boss said, if you were going to come in here and work all weekend, you needed to be working on what I thought was important. Um, and and I, I don't think the boss was a bad guy. I know he wasn't a bad guy. Um, but, it, but it's this, this it, it's, it's a clash of the company is getting paid by customers to do certain things and it has a process to get those customer requirements in. Whereas in the free software world, customer requirements come in through Bugzilla or IRC chat channels or mailing lists. Um, and, and so there's a different process. And so I definitely think that companies are changing the projects that they get involved in. So you, know, you have these people that, that have gotten the project to the point where it's at. Um, and, and now you have these companies coming in and, and, and trying to participate in this project that's really exciting. And I think it's up to all of us to help corporations do the right thing. Um, it's, it's up to us to explain that 
having discussions on mailing lists in public is a good thing. And it's really hard for a company um, who keeps all their, you know, everything's proprietary information, especially their customer information, to have a discussion on a mailing list with a bunch of random people. I mean, to me, the strangest thing about a mailing list is I don't know who's on it. <laughs> that, that really bothers me still when I, when I write a message to a mailing list. I don't know who's all reading it. I can't see the people I'm talking to. Um, so for companies, it's even that much more scary. And, and so we need to help them see how IRC chat rooms, where you're available to people to ask a question at any time. We're having discussions on the mailing list where lots of people can give input, even if you don't listen to it necessarily. Um, you know, how those things are good. And then so my call to you guys, maybe I need new batteries, is, is to show companies, not to go in and tell companies they're doing it wrong, um, not to go to your boss and say, no, 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 I'm not going to do it that way, um, but, but start showing them success stories. And, and so we're working on this in GNOME of, you know, showing, you know, here's how the decision got made. And, and we can write that up and say, you know, when we decided, one, one of the things we haven't done well, like with GNOME 3, is, is showing how we decided to pick GNOME Shell and Zeitgeist. But if we can write up that, that story and explain how we got there, um, we can help show companies how that public decision-making process works and, and how they can use it internally, working with the community. Hey, I had one more slide. That one. Um, so this is my, my, my pitch at the end of the, the talk. I, I'm here for questions if anybody wants to ask, and I really like to hear people's stories if you want to share them. Um, one of the things that I would like to see us all do as a community is support the free software projects ourselves. Um, so one of the ways that companies influence free software is by giving them money. Um, I, I work for the Gnome Foundation. My salary is paid by donations from large companies, so I mean, I, I, I know this for a fact. But we'd, I'd really like to see us all support free software projects as a community. Um, and, and if everyone picked, you know, everyone gives to charities. If everyone picked um, which companies, which projects they were going to give $100 to or $200 to um, every year, we could be a completely independent organization. And we'd still take donations from the company, um, but we win our, our financial um, wherewithal would not be dependent on them. Um, so, so my call is go out and pick a free software project that can accept money. Not all of them can. Not all of them know what to do with the money that they get. I have no problem helping people figure out how to do Hackfest or something. Um, but but a pick, pick a free software foundation, GNOME Foundation, Apache, somebody, um, and, and, and donate um, at an individual level, not just at the company level. And uh, actually, at the GNOME booth, I'm showing you that there's a t-shirt that, that you, we give out to people that, that join our Friends of GNOME project. And we're actually raffling, well, we're give, having a contest for that one. Um, so take a picture of yourself with GNOME in some way, shape, or form. Upload it to Flickr with the tags that were mentioned before. And uh, we'll be handing it out on Saturday. So that, that's my, any questions about the talk or about supporting free software? Uh, could you give an example of a, comp of, of a free software that moved to a company situation but still kept kind of the same format? A project that was bought, like kind of bought by a company and kept the same? Well, I, you know, I don't know, uh, maybe if, yeah. free software that, that, that started getting enough donations so they could hire people or whatever, you know, and still kept that same uh, type of uh, liberty or whatever. So, so there's a lot of projects that now have a huge corporate influence. Like the GNOME, fund, GNOME project has 40% of our contributors paid by companies. Um, GNOME and Linux and stuff have multiple companies that, that invest in them. One that probably was like that was MySQL. Um, so MySQL was started by a company. Um, but they had a, a large community of people that worked on it, and they eventually, I think, hired most of their community. Um, so anybody who had written anything significant for MySQL got hired by MySQL. Um, I don't know long term. I mean, it, it's a very successful project. Um, I think it getting bought by Sun adds a whole new angle, and if it gets bought by Oracle, that adds a whole new angle. So I don't know what will happen long term. But that was definitely a project that was started as a free software project and had a huge corporate influence. What about something like WordPress? Yeah, Word, WordPress was, was it started by the company or was it started first as a free software project? It was free and, and then they started the company as, oh, the other one is, um, they're in Atlanta, um, Drupal guys too, Sa same thing, they started a, yeah, so, so Drupal is an open source software project, WordPress, and they both now have companies associated with them. And they're still, it's probably been a couple of years and they're both still very successful. Yeah. Yeah. So something I noticed as I was visiting uh, Digium, um, they've kind of grown into a company that's bigger than just free software hackers that started it. 
how do you keep the company kind of the ethos, I guess? Um, you, know, you start out with a hacker, they just want to work on it for whatever reason. You grow into a bigger company, you got all these people who are working on it just for the money. How do you keep those kind of conflicting viewpoints, keep everybody moving forward, keep them all excited about the project? So I, I think personally, if I had a company, I wouldn't hire anybody that was in it just for the money. And I, 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 th I think that's... But, but I think that's true of any company, any product, not just free software. I think when you have a company where you have some people that are just coming in for the paycheck, your company won't be as successful. I mean, it, granted, I mean, everyone needs a paycheck to eat, but, but you should be hiring people that they bought your product at home because they thought it was cool. And, and I mean, when, when you work for a company um, that makes some kind of Unix product and all your employees have Macs at home, I mean, you need to stop and think, you know, are, are you making the right product? Are you letting them affect the product? And, why doesn't it do what they need it to do? Um, so I think you need to always hire people that, that love the project. But I think the key, I think your real question, I think the, the key answer is that you need to make sure the organization is set up right. Um, so like for example with community managers, there's been a huge debate of should community managers be in the engineering team, the marketing team, or the customer support team? Um, where do they belong? And, and I think by picking where they belong, you make a huge difference in your company. Where do they belong? <laughs> I, <laughs> It's a huge debate. I would. I think it depends on the life cycle of your project. Um, I think in the beginning they belong in engineering for sure. Um, maybe they can move to marketing later, but I think they they have to live close to the product because in, especially in the beginning, a lot of the community things is problems people have with the product. Um, I also think that engineering should have to do some kind of stint in customer support, um, just because. <laughs> in, in your. And I do think like the founders and stuff stick stick to it much longer. I, I don't have any concrete data that shows that. But I agree there's definitely a founders. The founders definitely usually care most, right? In your presentation you said that you found that companies that paid for features often had a more negative impact than companies that paid salaries. Can you explain that a little more why it would have a negative impact or what cases where you got that? Yeah. Um, and so I didn't say it's a, it has a negative impact. It's just not as benign as just paying for a salary. And I think the main thing is you work on free software because you want to. You get to decide what you work on. You get to decide how to design it. You get to, you know, you have full control and you get to work within the framework that has proven successful for free and open source software projects. So you, you continue to work in that same framework. And so the paycheck doesn't change how you work or how you feel about it. Um, when you pay for a feature, now all of a sudden you're getting paid not necessarily for something you believe is the right thing to add. I mean, I'm going to give you $10,000 to add this feature. If it's $10,000 and you need money, you're probably not going to argue with me too much about this feature isn't the right one to add to the project. You're just going to write it. Um, so I changed your motivation. I changed what you worked on. I changed how much you would argue back with me and whether or not it was a good feature because I'm just going to pay you for it um, as opposed to asking you for it. Um, so so it, it changes what you work on and why. Any other questions? Yeah. Has, have you or has anybody looked at the Google Summer of Code and how effective that's been for the project and for the people participating? Yes, yeah, so I've asked Leslie Hawthorne from Google for the numbers a number of times, and I haven't gotten the numbers yet. I'd, I'd love to see the number of students that participated, and obviously it wouldn't be 100%, but I'd love to see how many stick with the project. Um, also, the GNOME community is looking at our personal ones. Um, we do get people that go through Google Summer of Code and become GNOME contributors and stay. So I don't know the success rate, but we, we have successes. Um, and, and that's very much a, and that's almost a different question, though. It's not, were you working on it for free, you got paid, and then you no longer got paid? In that case, usually they attract people that weren't working on free software, and they pay them to join the project. And I actually think that's a, a harder sell. Um, and, and I actually think that's one of the reasons that we see less women at these conferences, because I think more men tend to get into free software on their own time and, and then get paid to do it. Whereas I think if you were to take all the, and I, I haven't done the survey, but we're going to do a survey. I think if you took all of the women that were in free software and asked them how they get started, I, I think a huge percentage of them got started as part of their paid job. So they didn't start working on it first and then get paid. They got paid to work on it. Yeah. 
I think you might have just answered it, but I was going to ask: Do you have any? Do you have any relational data to uh, women in, in the technology industry that get paid versus women in the technology in, in specific open source? Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way. So the, the um, National Center for Women in Computing is going to be doing a, a survey about women in free software. Um, and that, that's a good question to add. So I, I don't know the answer to that. My guess would be that close, you know, 80% of women in free software are paid to do what they, as opposed to 40%. I'm, I'm just totally guessing, but yeah. When, I was wondering if there was someone who looked at um, uh, professional expectations. My, my father was a, a lawyer <laughs> who used to practice, and, and when he was start, started out, there was the expectation that uh, they would do pro bono work, so if someone couldn't afford it, they were going to do a certain percentage uh, for charity. Then later, legal aid came out, and so that became a separate job for people to, to, to handle those cases. And uh, I'm starting to see in some of the, the non-open source conferences, people comment that, that you ought to do some open source just for being professional. I'm wondering if people would do that. No, that, that's, that's a really cool movement if, if it worked. But no, I, I haven't heard anything about it, but I like the idea. So, right there. It, it seems to me that every project or every job has unpleasant or dreary tasks. Um, and uh, when you run up against those, that's when you remind yourself, well, you know, that's why they're paying me, so I'll keep working when, 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 uh, when those unpleasant times come along. Who does the unpleasant tasks in open source and why? What motivates them to go through the drudgery um, if they're not being? Some of them don't get done my documentation. <laughs> so, 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 so some of them don't get done, um, but at the same time, the, the GNOME documentation team is not paid to work on documentation. Um, and, and they just had a hack fest recently. So I think some people just know that that has to get done, or you believe in your project enough, you spend some amount of time pushing through it. Um, I also think, luckily, lots of different people have different interests. So the documentation team in GNOME actually likes writing documentation. Um, so, so I, I think the, the myth that you have to pay somebody to do the, I think it's a myth that you have to pay somebody to do the drudge, drudge, drudge work, whatever the word is. Um, I, I think what actually does is you have to sell the vision. Um, I think if you can sell the vision and this project is really important and you know, people in Africa are not gonna be able to use our product unless we do, you know, we do all the localization bits so it can be translated. I, I think you sell people on the vision as opposed to paying them to get through it. Kind of like the New York City school kids. Like instead of paying them to get through it, they should be motivating to show them why it's important. Way up there. Just to add on that, typically in a company scenario, at least when I was there, typically awful to ask the worst tasks of the lowest junior developers that used to have a pilot on them and then spending days and days on tasks of life. Whereas in the open source, I've seen a lot of times that if all, you know, all the developers do a little bit of the unpleasantness in things like documentation, you know, you spread that load across everyone. It, it tends to be only obviously an hour or two on this, and with 10, 23 people, it can be a lot done. So like the hack test and stuff for documentation work really well. And so if we shift that paradigm, you know, if everyone needs to do a little bit of the not so much fun stuff to do, then you get a lot done with all the people with a lot less pain here than a single individual. And, and can you do it in fun ways? Like the hack fest have proven successful for us, I think. Um, OpenSUSE so does like a hack week where everyone doesn't get together in the same place, but they all work on those tasks the same week. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, a note on that. Some of the, what people consider to be the most unpleasant tasks, in the end, can have the biggest reward. I've spent two days doing something that was mundane and boring, but in the end, the program ran five times faster. Yeah. Um, just going back to the documentation thing, one question back. Uh -huh. you know, um, there's, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Identity Air Project. It's an ERP system, pretty complex. There's like no documentation out there. So it was uh, interesting. A lot of developers consider documentation to be something that, well, I'd rather be coding than writing manuals. But there's people that are the opposite. They would rather be writing documentation than coding. And so a lot of it's, uh, we as a community are, uh, have this responsibility of, of not just talking with coders about these open source projects, but talking with people that may be able to contribute in non-coding ways. Uh, 
for example, I, I went to uh, Rio Vida and it's near where I live, and I actually talked to a few professors. And now they've got it set up so students that are doing internships will be in the air project writing annuals. Cool. You know, so a lot of it's our responsibility just spreading the word to non-coders. And, and pulling on your user base a lot helps that. Your power users are often most frustrated with the lack of documentation and most willing to help out. Yeah. Yeah. Fifteen years ago, a lot of the great innovation in open source was most, it seems like it was mostly unpaid. Now, if you, if you do a trend from 15 years to now, we're at 40 or 50 percent mm -hmm. paid. If you extend that curve to 50 years from now, are we going to end up in the same, are we going to end up in a scenario where 90 percent of software is paid and not, as, not the same innovation, not the same quality? So I, I, so I'm, I'm not saying companies decrease the, the quality. I'm saying that they're learning how to work with free software. Um, and so we need to help them learn. So I, I don't think they necessarily decrease the quality. My, my key question was, if they stop paying, will the people go away? Um, so, so will the number of contributors go up? Like from you know, zero, number of paid contributors, zero to 40, will eventually everyone be paid? So I, I hope everyone gets their dream job someday. So if, if what people really want to do is write free software, then I hope they can find a job paying for them. I don't think it'll all be large corporations. So right now, I think the 40% are mostly large companies, um, like the GNOME sponsors. I mean, Novell here employs a lot of people who work on free software. Um, so I, I don't think it'll be 90% of people are employed by large companies. But I, I hope we can come up with some more models like small companies, like small support staff for local industries that are free software jobs. Um, the grants, I'd really like to see more people writing grants to be able to work on free software projects with money from foundations that support good, good works. Um, so I, I don't know if we'll ever get to 100%. I don't think if we get to 100%, it'll be bad for the free software community necessarily. Um, so I, I don't know where we'll end up. Um, I do know that most of GNOME's new contributors come from universities, and the students aren't, aren't paid. So hopefully the trend of people continuing to start working on it because they find it fun will continue. All right, so I'll be around for a couple. Oh, one more. And up. Um, what is the value of uh, development paradigms? Um, just a little, little backstory. Um, I work for Miguel de Casa, mm -hmm. and uh, he's you know he's the VP of this big company, uh, and he'll meet other VPs and they'll say, oh, so what what kind of paradigms are you using? We're trying to implement Scrum over here, and Miguel kind of looks at him and says, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I, my stuff needs to get done. And, He's I using the open source paradigm. Well, well, so it, is it a paradigm? I, I think or, so. Or, or is, it, is it a lack of paradigm? I, I think it's a, it's a paradigm. And, and it's, it's more than just like how releases happen. I, I think how the communication happens is like the really key points, or at least coming from proprietary software development to open source software development. To me, one of the key pieces is, is the, how the communication happens. Um, so I think when people start working in free software, the biggest shock is there's no meetings. Um, well, there are kind of meetings, but they're not where everyone gets in an office and, and talks. Um, all of the decisions and all the discussions, including the disagreements, are very public. Um, there's mailing lists where you can search the archives and find everything that's happened in that project in the past. That's, that's huge. How many, how many companies have a place within the company that you can go and search and find out how the company made it to that place? Well, like why the product has that feature? Um, I know you said that you couldn't find the decision that you were looking for the other day, but, but generally in the free software world, there, there's a whole archive. You know, I, I actually went back yesterday and I wanted to see how something had happened in the advisory board in Gnome, and, and we had email all the way back from 2001 when it started, and I found like when I participated in things I didn't even remember writing. Um, so so those, those types of things are, are really powerful, and I think they make a paradigm. Um, it's, it's not a formal process where you know if, if you do the following 10 things, you get certified as a, a free software development process, but I, I think those, those models, um, let's not go there, <laughs> those, those models um, do, do form a paradigm that's very powerful. And maybe if we had documented them more, um, people would understand them more and adopt them more. All right, so I'm, I'm around for the morning, so if anyone wants to, to grab me afterwards, I'm here. Thanks very much.